Maybe I should, uh, here we yes, go. Yes, there we go. There yep. we go. Yes. Uh, thank you so much. Welcome everybody. Uh, my name is Guy Raz and I host a program on NPR called the TED Radio Hour, uh, which is not a news program, but in, in, my, in my old incarnation, I was a news reporter, correspondent, and host, uh, which I will explain why that is relevant in a moment. Um, it is my absolute pleasure to be here with these two incredible journalists. Um, Nicholas Kulish is a, an award-winning correspondent for the New York Times. Um, he was a Berlin bureau chief from 2007 to 2013. Um, I have long admired his work from afar. This is, this is the first time I've met him in person. Um, but um, uh, as somebody who once covered Germany, it was a great pleasure to read somebody cover Germany with, with intelligence and grace and humor and, and real depth and sensitivity um, over, over his six years in the country. Um, Sue Ed McKennett is somebody I know very, very well. Uh, we met in Hamburg shortly after uh, the September 11th attacks when she was working. Um, she was an investigative reporter working with Peter Finn from the Washington Post, who is in this room here today. Um, and we forged a very close friendship um, right then and there and have known each other since. Um, uh, Sue Ed has won every award under the sun. She has been threatened and jailed and shot at in any, every country you can possibly imagine. Um, and thankfully, she's uh, uh, spending a little bit more time in Frankfurt, Germany, and here uh, in the US, keeping away from those, those places. Um, so in 2009, Suad and, and, and Nicholas um, partnered on a project that was so extraordinary, it really it really shook the world of Holocaust scholarship, of justice seekers who've been following the mystery, the mysterious case of this man, Herbert Heim. Um, he was a doctor who carried out some of the most cruel and inhuman experiments on human beings um, in modern history, places that are really etched in our consciousness, names that, that we all know, Buchenwald, Mauthausen, Sachsenhausen. He was known as Dr. Death. Um, and after the war, he escaped prosecution. He lived as a gynecologist for a few years um, in Germany. Um, but in 1962, war crimes investigators started to catch up with him. And as they began to close in, he disappeared without a trace. And that is the jumping off point for this incredible book, Suad and, and Nicholas, welcome. And, and again, it's such a pleasure uh, to be able to, to talk to you about the story. First of all, give us some background um, as to who he was. Who was Herbert Heim, Nicholas? Sure. Um, Herbert Heim was, uh, was born in, in Austria in a, a, a small uh, Austrian frontier town called uh, Rodkersburg that uh, after World War I was actually divided uh, between Yugoslavia and, and Austria, half the town on the south, half the town on the north, which is significant because that led to a really strong surge of right-wing feeling uh, in the town. His brother uh, joined, the, joined the SS, and uh, after, after medical school, Ari Bertheim uh, also joined the SS. So he was a committed, uh, committed true blue, true believing Nazi from the early days. Well, his brother was, in the, in the family lore and in some letters that have actually popped up, it's clear that his brother was as, as hardcore a, a Nazi as an Austrian could be. He took part in the 1934 putsch that failed to turn Austria Nazi. Austria, yeah. uh, and he then joined Hitler's Austrian Legion in Germany. In the, in the family stories, Ari Bertheim is a little, a little more cautious, kind of the one who says to, to, to look before you leap. Um, but. But it's possible that after his brother's death at the, be, at the beginning of World War II and the invasion of Crete, that, that his views uh, also hardened uh, and, led, and led him to, to what he would later do at Mauthausen. He, uh, as a young man, uh, received his med medical degree in, in Austria at the age of 25. This was going to be his profession. He was going to be a doctor. He was not, I mean, was there any sense at that time that he was a committed ideologue and, and, and that? 
uh, Nick rightly said at the beginning, he was actually more t committed towards becoming a doctor. And he actually also at one stage told his brother, Josef, that uh, Josef should not actually follow um, just Hitler's ideology. And he, he told him, Hitler is not going to give you um, your degree. Hmm. So finish your um, um, degree first, and then you can see, uh, look out for political uh, activism. But um, something changed when um, his brother was killed. And uh, we know from um, letters and also from archive and, and materials. And brother was killed in battle. Yes, actually he was tortured and some, uh, one of his friends later on went to um, uh, Haim's mother um, and explained to her how he was basic, basically tortured to death and this somehow triggered something and left something behind in Aribad who then became much more committed as well towards the Nazi ideology. So how does, how does this young man go from you know, a 25 year old graduate of medical school to to, to the Waffen SS. How does that process begin and, 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 and then what begins to happen at that point? Well, according to records, he was, he was already a member of the, of the SA, um, bef the, the, the stormtroopers as, as we call them, uh, bef before, he, before he joined the SS. And the, the famous uh, anatomist, uh, Edward Pernkopf, who, who signs his diploma and who was sort of a, one of the main, main figures at the of Viennese uh, medical school in those days, would actually give lectures wearing a brown stormtrooper uniform. Mm. So I mean, to give you a sense of sort of what the, what the times were like in, in Vienna in the late 30s, I mean, it was really a place where uh, students dressed as, as Nazis could, could, could beat and torment Jewish students in, in the hallways. Uh, so it was, it was a fairly logical progression then, I think, to, to join the SS. So what happens then? I mean, where, where, does, where is his first posting at, at, you know, in the war? What, what is his first assignment? Where does he go? Well, he started first as a troop doctor. Um, he was actually not supposed to, um, to take care of inmates. That what his job was to be a, a doctor for all the other. In the field. In the field. Mm -hmm. um, but um, then um, eventually some of these uh, doctors also ended up uh, treating inmates, and that's uh, the, the the point that was actually the the most, let's say, interesting also for Nazi hunters was his time in Mauthausen, the concentration camp, where um, he has been accused of like killing uh, inmates uh, by um, injecting gasoline into their hearts and committing some other criminal acts. So that's basically where you could see that he used um, his profession that actually was supposed to to save lives. Um, and turned it into something that uh, the accusations say um, in, into like killing people, inmates. Um, Mauthausen, of course, is, is where most of the testimony, and we'll get to, I want to get to some right. of that and how, you, how, how we know about what happened there, but, um, but, but it was before that time that he was at Sachsenhausen, the, the camp right outside of Berlin, mm -hmm. right. and also at Buchenwald yes. later yes, on. Yes, correct. And do we know what, what happened there, what he did there, what his role was? You know, very, very little is known uh, about what he did there. There was one, one inmate who was, also, uh, who was also in Mauthausen who said that he, he believed that he had committed, uh, that he had committed murders uh, at, at other concentration camps as well, and that he had threatened him and said, you know, we'll, we'll do it like we did in Oranienburg if you, if you don't keep your mouth shut. Sachsenhausen is. Uh, right. in Sachsen, yeah. Yes, exactly. Um, and, uh, and so that's, that's as much as, as is really known. Uh, but you know he was he was in these camps very early uh, in the war, and so you're asking witnesses to survive then for s six years in a Nazi concentration camp in order to survive and and tell their tales, which unfortunately was not not very likely. Do we know roughly when he he's transferred to Mauthausen? Yes, he arrived in uh, in I believe it was September, late September, 1941. And so just to sort of set the context, and, and I'm sure most people here in the room know a little bit about that camp. That was a, a, a concentration camp, a notorious camp. It was primarily a labor camp with a huge quarry. Um, they did have a crematorium there um, right on the banks of the Danube. I mean, a stunning setting. I'm sure you probably visited Mauthausen, uh, and it's uh, uh, quite a contrast to go there and to see the river and the, and, and the river valley below. Um, he gets there in 1942, and 
he becomes the primary doctor or he becomes one of many doctors there? Do we know? He became, according to witnesses, one of many doctors. And actually, in one of the um, papers that we later on found in his briefcase, I'm sure we're going to get to yeah. that, um, he actually wrote um, in, in one of his CVs that he spent six weeks only. Um, but that was where his words, but in, um, during these six weeks, he, according to um, witnesses and testimonies of witnesses, um, you know, committed this 